the, the sermon that I had planned for this morning, I'm not going to do. I'm going to do a different one um, because of that letter that we received from Mexico, Bay uh, It's a sermon that I was planning on doing in a couple of weeks, but I didn't do it today. But I'm going to tell you what I was going to do today. Uh, I've been speaking lately, I've been building up to this one, um, speaking lately about possibilities for the church to interface with society, connect with society. And I was going to flesh that out uh, a little bit more today. Um, it's really interesting that in a time, especially in Quebec, but not uniquely in Quebec, that we're talking about separation, like, you know, the secular society and the secular charter and all the rest of that. Um, it's, it's, it, it's really interesting that the government and the social ethos that's pushing the secularization of our society has also passed laws that um, for places like the Vallas or Shadow Royal or Sunrise, to get government subsidies, they must provide for the spiritual care of their people. And it's, it, 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 it seems contradictory, uh, but it's easy to put a word like spiritual because it doesn't have any content. You know, you can make it be anything you want, from sitting in a circle and everybody going, um, uh, to, to anything else. Um, but it really is interesting. I want to talk uh, at some length uh, in, in, in several sermons about uh, the gods of this world and, uh, and, and our God. Because um, I am firmly of the opinion that our society worships. Uh, we may not have little graven idols made out of clay anymore, uh, though sometimes we actually do. Um, we, just, we just have them on YouTube and they're called music videos. But anyway, um, uh, we, we worship gods. And uh, I'm going to be doing sermons of basically talking about three of the gods that we worship in our society. One is Mars, the god of war. Um, second is Mammon, and uh, in the Bible it says you can't worship God and Mammon, uh, or God and money, but uh, money is much more symbolic. It's not literally, you can't worship a coin, that's not what's being said. It's what it represents, stuff, you know? Uh, and the third is Aphrodite, God's the sex. Um, and if we were to trace these back into their origins, very few Romans or Greeks would have actually believed in the literal, physical embodiment of Mars, Man, or Aphrodite. Uh, they saw the more symbolic representations. And what I would like to suggest in our society, we have cults of worship around these three. And so when we go into society and spirituality, it's not we're going into a void. We're going, we're coming up against something else. You know, and so I want to talk about that. But uh, I'm not going to do this. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story. Okay. And uh, I think you guys know that I prepare my sermons way in advance. I've always got three or four percolating for down the road. That's one of the reasons. Uh, it was a learning exercise why I, I, I can preach without notes. If I show up with notes on Sunday, and I probably do about once every couple of months, is because I haven't had enough time to prepare and I'm not satisfied. Uh, so I want to make sure that I get my points covered. Uh, but this is coming, what's going to come in the future. I'm going to have to come up with another one. A uh, story from the past. Uh, I think most of you probably know that when I was growing up, my, my big sport, the sport that I really liked most was, was football. I don't know why. Uh, maybe I had aggression that I couldn't get out in any other way, and the football field was a good place to do it. Um, and there was this special time in my life where I became really, really good at football. You all know the story of me going on Weight Watchers, you know, and going from, you know, chubby little Lauren uh, to a lot taller, leaner Lauren. Um, and that really advanced my football career like it was going crazy. My, my, my body was used to carrying around 50 extra pounds. And I shed the pounds and grew uh, maybe six and a half inches uh, in, in, in a short period of time. So I was fast and agile. It really helps you out. It means you get your knees messed up a lot more because they give you the ball a lot more. Be that as a thing. I'm telling you, I'm a really good rugby player. Suicide. Anyway, so I, I was a good football player. Well, I, 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 I played for city teams. I didn't play for school teams. Um, I, it, was, it, it just wasn't my thing. I played for city teams. And I played for some good city teams. Uh, some of you are probably old enough that you might remember George Springgate. Uh, he was a place kicker for the NEG Maple Leafs. Well, that's the team I played for. Not when George was playing. He's longer <laughs> time, but that's, that's, that's the team that I played for. So that's the level we're talking about. Um, we're talking definitely university level. Um, and and uh, indeed, one of the things that happened to me in my football career was um, uh, several of us were offered to try out uh, with the pros. And I had no interest in going pro because I wanted to be a minister. 
Um, but when you got to that level, you, you, were, you were pretty serious about football. And uh, so, so high school ball, even though it was people the same age as us, was sort of kiddie ball. You know, that's the way I saw it. But on this particular occasion, uh, there was a football game at my high school, West Hill High. And uh, it was against Lower Canada College. You know, those rich private school kids. And they could afford the coaches, they could afford the equipment, they could afford everything. Uh, I'm sure there were some nice kids there, but I didn't find you. Uh, um, and they were good. Oh, man, they were good. They, they, they always used to win. And uh, West Hill, it was like uh, whatever they were coming to West Hill, it was like a um, great humiliation. Uh, at that point, I was an assistant coach, you know, uh, with the West Hill team. And uh, on this particular occasion, uh, <laughs> I, I remember it this way. Please allow a little bit of latitude for faulty memory because I am 59 years old, but I remember it this way. Um, that there was, there were a number of members of the West Hill High School football team who decided that they weren't going to show up for the game because they just didn't want the humiliation. They didn't want the abuse of the bruises. They knew we were going to get creamed like 50-something to nothing. And um, so uh, we, we were basically going to default, you know. Uh, but that, you know, default, well, they're here anyway, so the bus, they come on their bus, so, well, let's have a game. And so, the coach of the Whistle team asked if he could suit me up, even though I wasn't really eligible, you know. And uh, they said, oh, sure. Um, but you got to understand, you know, this was not the level that I was at. And so, they, they, they dressed me up and uh, brought me up and uh, decided the best place for him was on defense. Well, I was in for 18 defensive plays and made 12 tackles. And if you know anything about football, you know that that's rather extraordinary. Um, I had been taught some of the secrets of how to play the game. And uh, one of the secrets, and Walter's going to smile at this one, if the opposite halfback has the ball and they're trying to do an end run, don't chase him. He'll always outpace you. Cut him off. Cut him off and then name him. And the other rule of football, all of you remember this because I'm going to test you on it at some point. Make the first hit the best hit. Is it like that in rugby? Yeah. It is, eh? Yeah. Make the first hit the best hit. Because from then on, they'll be tentative. So I got to tell you, the first hit that I made, the half pipe was running around the end. And I didn't want to hurt him or anything. I just made sure I was going as fast as I possibly could and put my helmet into the guy's gut. Instead of just putting my arm out and doing the shoulder thing, put my helmet into the guy's gut. And he sort of stayed down on the ground, wishing for death for a little while. But uh, he got up, he was funny. Uh, and, and that just basically, you know, from then on, their defensive players, uh, their offensive players who were defending their ball carrier, when I would come along, you know, which it would almost go like, after you, <laughs> you know, like it was, it was, it, it was easy. And, and, and so, um, I, 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 I remember that, and, and I remember, you know, how, how, how easy it was. Boy, how easy it was. But you know, it was only easy because the bar, the standard that I was playing against was so much higher. You know, the Maple Leafs, the Maple Leafs were, let's say, not up there, but they were, they were there. You know, the McGill Redmond, well, a little bit up there. But this was the standard. And so I had started, you know, Adam, Mosquito, Pee Wee, Bantam, <coughs> Weight Watchers, up. You know, so that was my standard. So then you go, West Hill. And there's LCC. And LCC is so much better than West Hill. But they're going to cream West Hill every single time. It's going to be humiliation at a time when teenage boys don't like to be humiliated. Well, teenage boys never like to be humiliated. Um, but my standard was there because I was playing in, in a completely different league, you know? Now, I didn't feel exceptional or extraordinary or super good because playing in this standard, there were lots of people on the same level or better. In fact, if you were to invite the bear to come to church, who was one of the coaches, this is his nickname. He would probably say, yeah, Lord, he's pretty good, but he wasn't one of the best. But I was so much better than the people down here. You see, it, it, it depends on the bar you set. 
It really does. Um, and I would think that that's true for most fields of human endeavor. Um, whether we're talking about employment, our job, or family life, or, or career, or vocation, or volunteer work, or hobbies, like it's, it's a question of what bar do we measure ourselves against. And measure ourselves we do, but frankly I think measure ourselves we should, you know, as long as we, we don't do it in a punitive way against ourselves or against others, you know. But there's got to be a standard. And I firmly believe that one of the things that's going on in our society, frankly, is the standard we set, the bar we set, is so low as to be practically non-existent. And, you know, when I, when, I, when I think of that letter that Bethany read out, like obviously I read it before, you know, gave it to me. I look at that. And Paul Clark is a lovely, lovely man. Like, uh, I'd love to have him come on Sunday and talk about work. He's such a lovely man. He talks about the work that they do. The, the, the work that they do with refugees. And, and it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Uh, bringing over families of refugees, setting them up, housing them, feeding them, getting them employment, getting them. It's just extraordinary what they do. But you know, on the other hand, it isn't. It's not at all. It's extraordinary because we live in a self obsessed society. Uh, the benchmarks against which we me measure ourselves are, I don't have time to go with all of that, the wrong ones. And so we, 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 we hear a letter like that from Paul, and it's a good letter, and he should read letters like that, you know. But we should, well, isn't there this thing in the Bible that says something like, after you've done all that you're required to do and all that you should have done, Say something that, well, nonetheless, I am God's unworthy servant. You know? The, the standard we're to measure against is not a self absorbed world, but, but God's standard. And I've got to tell you, when, when, when I read that letter, the first thing that struck me in the letter uh, was about this family that just came over like a little less than two weeks ago. And they're going to be setting them up in an apartment. And I was thinking, you know, could I get up in front of St. Mary's and say, if anyone has a spare couch that they're going to be throwing in, i got to tell you this, could this just be a blurt, you know? The things that people throw in the garbage on the West Island, it makes me sick. It really does. And I hope you guys, this is not a criticism of you, obviously. Like, uh, Nick, Nick, but this is, this is crazy. Um, last week, Ben and Annie and Bert were over at Nick and Ruth's house, and Nick, just like, it's, it's in my genetic code too, Nick looks at some things that are in the garbage, and if something's nice, he picks them up, and the attorneys benefit occasionally from this, I'm not proud. Nick saw a bike in the garbage, and uh, took the bike home, and Ben and Annie and Bert were over, perfect bike for Ben, he said, one that's too small, one that's too big. And so, Nick said, would you like this bike? So I'm sort of wondering what this bike is going to look like. Okay, Nick took it in for a tune-up just to make sure that everything was okay. It didn't need any repairs or any parts. Just a tune-up. This bike is a Louis Garneau. Moses the high. Oh, it's, 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 right <laughs> it's a Louis Garneau. It's, it's, a, it's a hard tail. But it's a suspension front, if you, you know what I mean. Like it's, it, you know, soft tail is a spring-loaded tail for shock absorbing. For this is shock absorbing. It was in the garbage. It was in the garbage. And think of all the computers, TVs, furniture. Have you ever driven by somebody's garbage, looked at a couch out by the curb, and said, "Geez, that's better than what I got in the living room." <laughs> we we are in a society. And the values are all skewed. All skewed. And you know what? It's okay for me to sit here and talk about furniture because, let's face it, that's not going to cut too close to the ball. It really isn't. But the way we use our money, um, think of what's spent 
Oh, well, no, it was Pacific, let's spend on the military, you know. Uh, and so we, we spent something like 10 times more annually on the military globally than it would take to feed, clothe, house, and water every man and woman child on the planet. Wow. So what's the bar? What's the bar? You know, we bring over a few refugees in a world in which there are 85 million refugees and displaced people. And, and, and it's, it's worthy of, of, of a letter. Yes, it is worthy of a letter, but it's only worthy of a letter of thanks because of the society we're living in, the selfishness of it. What's the standard? What's the bar we measure ourselves by? My kids are starting to look at YouTube music videos. Uh, some of the music is kind of cool. I enjoy it, i got to tell you. But I'm looking at the values that are being communicated in the music videos. Um, just, just what's important and what's not important. Uh, what people's priorities are. And it's all messed up. It's all messed up. And so I think, how, how, how do you get it across? How do you get it across? Doesn't it strike you as weird? As, as I was saying before, that the same government, the, you know, there's the secular charter and all that sort of stuff. By the way, let me put this in brackets. This is starting to sound really disorganized even to me because it is. Um, let me put this in brackets. Do you know the idea of guaranteed separation of church and state? The way they talk about that now, it's as if they're trying to protect the state from the church. Do you know that that's totally backwards? That that whole idea of guaranteed separation of church and state was to pr protect the church from the state? And it goes back as far as the pilgrims. You know, because the pilgrims suffered persecution from the state in their time. And so when they made their pilgrimage, they wanted a separation of church and state so that they could worship the way they wanted to worship without interference from external sources. And we flip that on and say, as if we're trying to preserve the state from religion. It's totally backwards. So we're in this society in which we are trying to come across with some secular charter that's going to please them. Oh, come on, give me a break. Yet at the same time, that same government <coughs> passes rules that for seniors' residents to get government subsidies, they must take care of the spiritual needs of their people. But we're not going to tell you what those spiritual needs are because we're not going to set any standard. We let everybody make up their own standard, make up their own rules, because we don't want to sound like, and whatever, fill, fill in the blank cell. So what happens, the way we come across it is, somebody is a program director at a senior's residence, you know, and if they're inclined towards, towards religion, they'll call up churches and stuff, um, or if they're not, they might do a thing on mindfulness or Analysis, uh, meditation without any education training or content or context. You know, we are in a society where, hey, make up your own rules, determine your own values, and then you know what we'll do? We'll complain about our government when everything goes wrong. We'll complain about the quality of teachers when our kids mess up. We'll continue. We'll complain about everybody, but we won't look in the mirror. And the problem is from the start. We're not setting the bar right. We're just not setting the bar right. In fact, I would go so far as to say in our society we made a science of not setting the bar at all, of determinedly avoiding it. Because you know what? If you set a bar, well, that bar might tell you that maybe the way that person is living over there isn't so helpful. Oh, but we don't want to say that. Maybe what my kids are up to they shouldn't be doing. But we don't want to say that because we want to maintain our friendship with them, our relationship with them. You know, maybe the husband or the wife who says, you know, all these hours I'm putting in for work, all this overtime, I'm doing it for my family. And they're lying. They're lying to themselves and to their family. They're lying because if they were doing it for their family, they would take a look at what their family's needs were. And maybe their, need, their family's needs aren't for an extra 20,000, 40,000 a year. Maybe their needs are for dad or mom to be home with you. Know? But we don't want to say that because we're allowing somebody else to determine the agenda. And there are a lot of somebody else's in our society. So what's the Christian response to this, or a Christian response to this? Because what I would suggest is generally God speaks to us 
If God was here, he would use power. I have absolutely no doubt of that. And uh, he would bless and grace Bill Gates and call him Saint Bill. Um, or Saint Bill, whatever. Uh, God, God, God gives us a power line. You know, and that's the, what the Bible is. It's, it's power lines. Um, it will never tell you the specific answer to each of life's specific questions. Like, for example, there are some things that Jesus really doesn't say anything about. Um, that's not to say he's necessarily not interested, but it's just not on his top ten list. For example, um, Jesus doesn't truly say anything about homosexuality, but he says about how we should treat each other in relationships. Um, he doesn't say anything about um, polygamy or monogamy, or he doesn't say anything really about premarital sex or anything like that, or extramarital sex really does really with different prostitutes. Um, because when women had extramarital sex in Jesus' time, it was considered prostitution. So there you go. Um, but there's so many things that Jesus doesn't say anything about. But what he does do, what God does do, is he speaks in bullet points. And he says, this is how you should treat each other. And when people are clueless uh, or can't read, uh, he, he draws them pictures. And uh, when that's not enough, then he says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something that you can't miss. I'm going to act this out. I'm going to act this out for you. And so Jesus responds to the problems that the world faces, the problems that you face, that I face, is to act things out, tell stories. Sometimes he tells stories, sometimes he acts out a story. And one of the stories he acts out is this. He says, look, you folks are going to get together because you need to get together to support one another. You can't live apart. You know, part of, part of humanity is coming together. <coughs> and we even know that from a historic and archaeological point of view. One of the first things that happens when people climb down from the trees or up out of the primordial ooze is they start gathering together in clans and tribes and groups. Yes. We can't live alone. And one of the signs of the brokenness of our society is how that loneliness is and how many relationships break up and all the rest of it. It's a sign of brokenness. So Jesus says, you know, you, you folks have to come together. But you have to some, have something that brings you together. And your bridge club is fine. Did you just know Jesus played bridge? I don't know if you did. Uh, but your bridge club is fine. You know, going fishing with your buddies is fine. You know, playing football, oh, that's magnificent. You know, <laughs> Jesus threw the ultimate hail Mary pass, but that's just a little joy. Okay, um, good. Um, but you know, when you come together, it's just, you, 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 you gotta focus, you gotta focus. And so, I'm going to do something now, and I want you folks to remember this. And the bread we broke it. He said, whenever you get together, I, I really want you to do this. But remember, it's not just, it's not just a loaf of wonder bread. That this represents the brokenness of my body. And the brokenness of Christ's body is a symbol of... I I guess we, uh, <laughs> a strange child in aisle four. Um, it's a symbol of the brokenness of, of my body. So oh, I better wait. This is great. This is great. <laughs> the church is a family, and this is family. So uh, it's a symbol of the brokenness of my body. And 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 what Jesus is doing there is saying, this brokenness represents the whole of humanity. It represents the brokenness of your body. You know, it represents the brokenness of your relationships, the brokenness of, of your heart. That's why he did that, because he also knew that in him was healing. And then he does it with the cup. He says, this, this represents my blood. Because you shed your blood, too. Um, sometimes you shed your blood when, when you're in a traffic accident because some guy was so tired, so frustrated, so fed up with life that he got trashed and decided he could drive home anyway. And you're lying there bleeding on the side of the road. You're shedding your blood because of something else. Um, sometimes you shed your blood because this society worships Mars. And uh, at 19 years old, you were sent to a foreign country uh, on a mission that really didn't have a whole lot of definition to it. Uh, no law, not much entry game, no exit strategy, and you're just there, and someone uses you for target practice, and you're really shedding your blood. Uh, 
Uh, but you don't want me to literally, you're doing metaphorically as well and symbolically as well, you shed your blood. When, when you gather, remember, I shed my blood as a sacrifice. A sacrifice to, to do what? To do what? Get that in a minute. He also did something else that same night, which, by the way, we're commemorating this Thursday at 7 o'clock, Monday, Thursday. He, um, he did something else. He, he, he stripped and uh, got the tower on his waist and um, called up for volunteers, you know, as volunteers. And uh, he washed his washed the feet. And he said, look, I'm the Lord here, <laughs> you, you know who I am. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm setting a bar here for you folks. And it's this, if you want to be the greatest, be the least. If you want to be the master, be the servant. That's it. The new bar is not see how much you can get for yourselves. The new bar is not see how much you can save for your retirement. The new bar is not you know, whether or not you can wear a job, move and get your picture taken. The bar is this. How good a servant are you? How good a servant are you? That's the bar. And that's what you're being taught. You know, I started this in a funny place when we finished. Hopefully not quite so funny a place. I started in football, you know. And boy, if you'd seen me on the field that day with Lower Canada College, you might, you might have made a real mistake. You might have thought because of my performance, I was much, much better than I really was. Because the team I was playing against, even though they were the best of their level, were not anywhere near my level. And so I looked really, 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 really good at that particular game. Whereas really I was just an average player. I was an average player, not destined for superstar. Well, it's all about the lens that you look at life through. And we are supposed to look at the world, the refugees from Mexico refugee, or whatever else we choose to support, and it goes on in those two cases for Africa, et cetera, et cetera. We're supposed to look at the world through Christ's lens. And that lens is a lens of personal sacrifice, in lifestyle and in every other way, and of servitude. If we really get that, then we understand the meaning of Holy Week and Easter. Because Easter says it's all going to work out in the end. And we call that the Kingdom of God. So now, can we pray, as the people of Israel have been doing for over 2,500 years, for the coming of the Kingdom of God? Let's pray. God, we thank you that um, we live in a world in which there are lots of possibilities and lots of resources, where there's plenty for everybody. But we also really acknowledge that our world is a place where there's an incredible amount of brokenness. And unnecessarily so. We think of all this conflicts. Uh, we think of what happened with that Lufthansa airplane this week, and we just don't understand it, but we see the results, we see the brokenness. And so we pray for our world. Um, but also, as we pray for the world, we don't just pray for the world, we pray for ourselves too. And sometimes we don't know uh, in practical terms what the standard is and what's expected of us that in relation to many who look pretty good, um, but in relation to your standard, it's sometimes not so sure. And uh, in that letter from Paul at uh, Exo Refugee, you just see the need and our, our lifestyle and our needs are just so different. So God, open our hearts, open our minds, and give us the will to be your servant people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now.